start, we wanted to give you just a few different ways that you can connect with us online during this time. The first way you can stay connected with us is to make sure you follow us on all of your social medias. We're available on Facebook and Instagram, both under Troy First Baptist Church. Second, make sure to keep up with our website, which has a bunch of resources available for you. The first thing to do is make sure to check out upcoming events. If you click that, you can see everything that's upcoming in the next few weeks that you can join us for. If you've missed any of our past services, feel free to click on sermons and scroll down to the first video, which will be the last week's service. You can also check out our evening services right below. If you want to watch any other past service, make sure to click watch more and that will bring you to our YouTube page. Parents with children of fifth grade and under, make sure to hover over ministries and click our children's page. There you can get information about our ministry and you can also check out every week's virtual kids club right here on this video. If you have students grades six through 12, make sure to hover over ministries and click on youth. There you'll get information about our youth, but you can also watch our last week's youth lesson on this page as well. If you ever need to get in contact with us, make sure to click on contact. There you can find our information and a contact page where you can email us. If you have any questions about our church at all, but can't make it here in person, make sure to check out our chat with a pastor. After this service is over, you're welcome to join a video chat with one of our pastors. Make sure to text this number with your phone number and name, and we'll get in contact with you right after the service. Thank you for joining us today. Now we want to invite you to worship with us together. Good morning, Troy First Baptist Church. Do me a favor. Will you stand up and let's sing Be Thou My Vision together.
things to look forward to. Good morning, and welcome to Troy First Baptist Church. Here are a few announcements to add to your calendar. If you would like to help our students go to camp, we have a few ways to donate. If you would like to pay for a trip for a single student, $250 will send that student to Caswell. $125 takes care of half a trip. If you would like to donate towards a full or half trip for a student, you can do so by check or by clicking on give at troyfirstbaptist.net. Of course, any size of donation is appreciated. Youth. Make sure to be here at 5.30 for tonight's youth service. We're finishing up our series on anxiety. All youth, make sure to be here on February 14th to our youth Valentine's party at 5 p.m. We will have a heart-shaped dinner and play some Cupid games. Also, make sure to check out our online adult service every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on either our Facebook or YouTube page. Make sure to stay updated with everything we are doing here at Troy First Baptist Church and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, check out our website at TroyFirstBaptist.net. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Indonesia. A spiritual conflict rages for Indonesia. Ancient and strong occult powers seek to oppose the influence of the gospel, while modern Muslim strategists seek to eliminate Christianity and remove the presence of the good news. Pray specifically for the binding of these powers and for continued growth of the church. Let's take a moment and pray for Indonesia. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We do lift up the, the country of Indonesia. Uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are there. It looks like there's only about 3% of the population of about 200,000. So God, we lift them up and we, we pray that you would strengthen them. Um, and I pray that they, they would not feel hopeless, that they would not feel like they're just spinning their wheels, but God, that they, they would be truly reaching a nation for you. We pray that we see that statistic get higher and higher and higher until we see Indonesia as a part of the kingdom of God. Be with the lost there. Be with us as we continue through this service, God. May we lift up worship um, to you. We love you. Amen. Stand with us and sing when we all get to heaven.
seated. scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians 12. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 
On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, and that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the body that is gathered here in person and online. We thank you for allowing us to come together and to worship you and to hear your word. We ask for your blessing over the rest of the service. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I love music, listening to it, making it. I like making music together with others. It's one thing to sing by yourself. It's another thing to sing with a few others. It's nice to play music on your own, but it's even better to play it together. And so I've always tried to be a part of a musical group. When I was a kid, I couldn't play guitar in the orchestra, so I had to learn the violin. But then something terrible happened to my left hand when I was 14 years old, and my teacher, my conductor for the orchestra said, I'm sorry you can't play the violin anymore, and I thought my days in the orchestra were over. The terrible thing that happened to my left hand was it grew, and it got so big, my meaty claws were too big to play the little violin. And so she suggested that I move to the cello. Everybody knows what a violin is. A violin is that beautiful instrument that plays the melody. You hold it under your chin. You can play it standing up or sitting down. But unlike the bass, the string bass that you play standing up like a man, the cello is an undignified instrument that must be played seated with the instrument between your legs. And this was a step down as far as I was concerned. I not only had to forsake the melody, the, the part of the music that everyone goes home whistling or singing, but I had to lug home this big case that was the size of a small car, and trying to negotiate this down the middle aisle of a bus was tough. It was even tougher if I had to carry it home from school walking. So you can imagine that that kind of discouraged taking the instrument home to practice at all. But when I did practice, it wasn't too pleasing, because instead of having the violin playing the melody that everybody knows and sings, I was playing, oftentimes not playing at all, long measures of rest. And then when I would come in, be playing one long note for measures and measures, filling out a chord. Or we would play these little musical fragments, kind of like musical hiccups. And when I would practice, when I would, my mother would call in from the other room, is the cat sick? Is, some, is someone dying in there? I don't know if she was kidding or not. For us in the cello section, this caused us to have great resentment for the violin section. I would go to orchestra and draw cartoons of cellos with heads making war on violins with heads, and of course, the violins were the villains, very close. And there's a reason why violin sounds like villain, because those guys got all the good parts and got all the glory. And so we ate our hearts out with jealousy until the conductor would raise her baton. And then we would make beautiful music together Why we were there. Now, I want to ask you today, does that kind of petty jealousy that kind of competitive spirit, misunderstanding and resentment take place in the body of Christ? Is it possible that there are cellos and violins in the church saying, I don't need them, or I wish I was one of them? I'm not a teacher, I'm not a preacher, I don't count. I can't do anything. How can we make beautiful music together as the body of Christ if we are feuding? How can we make beautiful music together if we can't get along? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul deals with a troubled, divided church. And he tells them how to make beautiful music together. 
And as we learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first thing we need to do to make any kind of music is we each must have a different part. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 says, Now there are now different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it is the same Holy Spirit who is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service in the church, but it is the same Lord we are serving. Next, next slide, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Different kinds of spirit, gifts, different kinds of service in the church. Listen, folks, we are not all violins. We don't all get to play the melody. Music also requires harmony and rhythm. There's no life or intensity without rhythm. You need the drums to keep the beat. You need other instruments to provide the other notes in the chord. This is the point that the Apostle Paul is making. When he says to this divided church, hey, we don't all have the same gift, and that's okay. He tries to explain that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts and decides which gifts we get. We all have different parts to play, but we all follow the same conductor. We all serve the same Lord. In verse 6, there are different ways God works in our lives, but it is the same God who does the work through all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. God works through every part in the orchestra. You may not be a violin. You may be a cello. You may even be playing the triangle but you have a part. You may not be the quarterback on the team. You may have a place on the offensive line or a place on the bench, but everybody on the team is important. The quarterback certainly can't win the game all by himself. You may not be the lead in the play. You may not even have a bit part. You may even be a stage hand, but where would the lead speak from if he didn't have a stage hand? You may not be the pastor, a teacher, a chairman of the board in the church, but do you have a part to play? It's okay, Paul says, God says. In verse 11, it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone, verse 11, decides which gift each person should have. The coach assigns who plays quarterback and who plays defensive line and who sits on the bench. The conductor decides where everybody will sit and what part is best for them. It is best if he or she makes the decision and not if everyone makes their own decision. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is using the illustration not of an orchestra or football team, but of a human body. The human body, each part has a different part to play. They all do something different. They all do something well, but they all do something different. To have a healthy living body, you not only need a mouth to consume the food and teeth to chew it and a stomach to break it down and digest it. You also need a hand to feed the mouth and you also need eyes to find the food. And it's the same way in a football team, in a drama, or in an orchestra. We've moved now from the New Living Translation, that's what NLT stands for, to the NJT, the New Jeff Translation. As I move to verse 12, let me talk about an orchestra instead of a body. He says the body has many members, many parts, but let me interpret that as the orchestra has many instruments, but the many instruments make up only one orchestra. So it is with the orchestra of Christ. Verse 14, yes, the orchestra has many different instruments, not just one instrument. Before I played the violin, I played the guitar. And a guitar is made to kind of play by itself if you have to, because you can play more than one note at a time and play harmony. But I couldn't play the guitar in the orchestra. There were no guitars in the orchestra. One time I went to a guitar recital where the guitar teacher had all 50 of her students playing at one time, all playing the same chords. And it was a loud sound, louder than one guitar, but it's not an orchestra if you have everybody playing the same instrument, everybody playing the same chords. It's not a band without the keyboards, without the vocalists, without the drums, without the rhythm. Verse 15, if the cello says, I'm not a part of the orchestra because I'm not a violin, that's the way we felt, 
Hey, that does not make it any less an instrument in the orchestra. Verse 16, if the second violin, you know the hardest part to play in the instrument, orchestra? Second fiddle. Yeah, you're a violin, but you don't get to play the melody. If the second violin says, I'm not a part of the orchestra because I'm only a second violin and not a first violin, would that make it any less a part of the orchestra? Of course not. There, Paul says, the ear says, I don't need the eye, or I'm not an eye. Hey, aren't you glad you have eyes and ears? Verse 17, suppose the whole orchestra were first violins. How then there would there be any harmony? Or if the whole orchestra were just playing harmony, how would you know the song without hearing the melody? Here Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Imagine if instead of a body walking in this morning, a great big eyeball rolled into church this morning. That would be scary. That would be disgusting. That poor eye wouldn't live very long though, right? How does an eyeball get around without feet? I guess it could roll. But how would it eat? How would it get sustenance without a mouth and a digestive system? Verse 18. But, he says, God has arranged the body. Let me say, the conductor has arranged the orchestra with many instruments. And he's put each instrument just where he wants it. Verse 19. What a strange thing an orchestra would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many different instruments, but only one orchestra. You know, in the church, of all places, we should celebrate our differences. In life, aren't you glad there's variety? Aren't you glad God didn't give us fuel like gasoline for your car? He gave us many different... What are we going to eat today? Probably something different than yesterday. We like variety when it comes to what we eat. We like variety when it comes to what we wear. We don't want to wear the same thing every day. And how boring life would be if every one of us looked the same. If everyone looked the same, how do we tell each other apart? People who are different do get stared at. Take it from somebody who's handicapped, someone who's short, someone who's tall. How's the weather up there? If you are different, you stand out and people tend to stare at you. Sometimes you are gawked at, sometimes laughed at, sometimes ostracized. So we must teach our children not to stare in public. And we have to fight the temptation to prejudge people based upon their color or their nationality. But the truth is God made us different. And who are we to say that person's different? They're not as good as me. They don't play violin. And so variety is God's idea. Apparently he too is bored by sameness. We say variety is the spice of life. Life is boring if everything was the same. We say, viva la difference. This is all by God's design because as Paul reaches the climax of this chapter, he says in verse 28, God has appointed these in the church. God has made different people, different instruments in the orchestra, different members of the human body, different gifts by God's design. God, on the creation week, made different kinds of animals. He made plants different than animals. And then he made each animal different from other animals. And each one of those animals in that species are different, just like we are all different. We could look at Jesus' disciples. Jesus didn't have one disciple, and he didn't have 12 clones of himself or 12 clones of Peter. He had opposites on his 12 disciples. He had one man named Simon the Zealot, Simon Zelotes, who was a religious, political patriot, maybe a rebel terrorist who was fiercely loyal to Israel and hated Rome. But then there was Matthew. Matthew, who wrote the first gospel, was a conspirator, conspirator with Rome. He was a tax collector and gave the money to Rome. You think those two guys got along? You think it's divided in Washington? Yeah, how, how do you think Simon and Matthew got along? There was Simon Peter, who was impulsive, quick to act, and Thomas, who was deliberate and slow to make up his mind. Can you imagine those 12 disciples being at each other's throat? Boy, I wish I was Peter and got to sit next to Jesus or John. Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Look, Jesus says, you're all different. I know that. I made you. I designed you that way. And we are all different. We are old. We are young. We are wealthy. We are poor. We are healthy. We are disabled. We are democratic or Republican, black or white, new Christian or mature. If you think of all of our differences, we have very little in common. Yes, we are different because we all have a different part to play. So don't resent someone because they're different from you. They do something that you can't or you can do something that they can't. Yes, in the, the body of Christ, some are teachers and some are leaders and some are musicians and some are not. And some are givers and some are cheerleaders and some are counselors. Some are caregivers, organizers, workers. To win a ball game, a team needs more than an offensive line. They need more than a quarterback. They also need a defense. To make music, you need more than just the violin playing the melody and the high notes. You need a bass to play the low notes and someone to play the triangle, someone to keep the rhythm. You need the white keys and the black keys to play the piano. And it takes all the keys to unlock God's heart. God made us and he made us different on purpose. And so let this place where we believe in the God who made us all and designed us to be different of all places, to be the place where we not only accept each other, but celebrate each other. I'm so glad you sing a different part. I'm so glad you play a different part because I can't play all of them. I can't play all of them well. I certainly can't play all of them at one time. We all belong. Are we different? Yes. And that is to be celebrated. That's the only way to make real music. But notice the title of today's study is Making Beautiful Music Together. Folks, if we're going to make beautiful music, then even if your instrument is big and bulky and the size of a car, you need to take it home and you need to practice. I mean, if the cello doesn't practice, the cello's going to make some squeaks and some squawks. Every part is important. So even if you don't play violin and don't play the melody, you still need to practice your part. This is Paul's point in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verses 21 through 27. Not all of us get to be quarterback. Not all of us get to be pastor. Not all of us get to be the conductor. We all don't get to be eyes or hands in the body. He says in verse 21, continuing back verse 21 in the New Jeff translation, the violins can never say to the cellos, we don't need you. The strings can't say to the woodwinds or the brass, we don't need you. He says the eye can't say to the hand or the head to the feet. Verses 22 and 23, in fact, he says, some of the parts that seem weakest and least important are really the most necessary. I mean, you can get the melody without the drums. The drums don't play any melody or any notes. But if there's no one keeping the time, everything falls out and there's no harmony because everyone's singing their parts at a different time. Sometimes those parts are more necessary. The parts we regard as less honorable, sometimes the conductor sits them right in the center of the orchestra in your body. Paul says that the parts of your body that get all the credit, like the eyes and the hand, everyone wants to be an eyes and a hand. Or a lot of people want to be the mouth. But you know what? You can live without an eye. You can live without two eyes, ask a blind person. You can live without a hand or even two. But you can't live without a liver. Not everyone wants to be a liver, but you know where God puts the liver? Not out where it can get chopped off. Puts it inside your body, surrounded by a rib cage, protected by other parts. The most important parts, you know, you can make, a church can make it without a pastor. A pastor doesn't have church. He's not really a pastor. And there are quarterbacks, yeah, but a quarterback is not going to win any MVP awards or not win any games if he doesn't have a team. It's going to be pretty bad. And so he says, sometimes what we think of as less, God thinks of as more. And so he says, verse 23, the wise conductor heaps more lavish praise on those playing in the shadows. Hey, great job, cellos. Great job, triangle. While the other parts, like the violins, you don't need to tell them they know they did a good job. They don't require this special care. Sometimes you've got to pat someone on the back who works behind the scenes because they don't feel like they're really a part. 
Verse 24 and 25, so the conductor has put the orchestra together in such a way that extra honor and care are given to those parts that get less attention. This makes for, I'll call it harmony among the members in the old King James. It's no schism, no division in the body. God wants all of us to play together to make beautiful music. Verse 26, if one instrument hits a sour note, the whole orchestra sounds bad. In the King James, it says, if one member suffers, they all suffer with it. And if each part plays its part to the best of its ability, the whole orchestra is applauded. The King James says, if one member rejoices, they all rejoice with it. You see, people may concentrate on the melody in the violins and go out humming its parts. But when they stand and applaud at the end, they always applaud the whole orchestra. Verse 27 tells us that it is a dreadful mistake to think that only those on the stage are important. Verse 27, now all of you together are, he says, the body, I'll say the orchestra. And each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. You see, a quarterback is important. Some would argue the most important part of the football team. The lead might be the most important part in the drama. The pastor might be the one with the name and the yellow pages. The soloist might get all the admiration in the song. But every part of the team, of the church, of the band are important. This is our mistaken notion of worship. We oftentimes confuse worship on Sunday morning with entertainment out in the world. In the world, what's important is on the stage, and we're out in the audience, we're just nobodies clapping for the famous performer. But actually, it's backwards in the church. You see, the people up here on the stage are stagehands who are leading you who are the lead worshipers, because God is back there looking at your faces, not the faces of the people holding the microphones and playing the guitars. God sees the worship of the whole church. Here's the orchestra. The orchestra is not up here on Sunday morning. The orchestra is here. And when we pray together before the service, before we practice, which we do every week, we say, Lord, help us to lead your people into worship, because the worship comes from out here. And so we have to understand that God doesn't focus on the stage. We might, but he focuses on our hearts. We say that worship is not a spectator sport, but a participation sport. And we really mean it because verse 27 says, each one of us is a separate and necessary part of our worship. So that's why it's important, even if you've got a cello, to take it home and to practice. And that's why it's very important for everyone in this room, everyone watching right now because of our remote worship, because of the virus, it's important that every one of us do our part because the pastor can't do it all and the deacons can't do it all and the teacher can't do it all. We need everybody's gift, everybody's part played. Romans 12, 6 says, having gifts differing according to grace that is given to us, let us use them. You see, this is a participation sport, and it's a team sport. It's not the pastor dueling the devil every week. No, it is the church trying to win the world every week. On a team, it takes offense and defense. You can have great offense, but if you have a defense, you're going to lose. We need both. The orchestra, the band, it takes every single part. And this is what made the early church so wildly successful. They knew, they had a division of labor. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 were baptized and added to church one day. We'd love that in one year. We'd love that in one decade. They had 3,000 added. How? Because they joined with other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. They came together... They didn't just practice their part at home, they came together. Yes, I took my cello home and practiced it, but if I forgot my cello and didn't bring it to orchestra during church, or if I didn't bring it to the concert, not very good. It's great if we practice our parts at home, do our best to study for our lesson or do what it is that we do get ready, but we need to come together. 
And this is an all-important message now more than ever. Notice in verse 44 of Acts 2, all the believers met together constantly. And they shared everything they had. Was it dangerous to meet together then? Yes, under the threat of death, kind of like now, right? They worshiped together at the temple, not on Sundays, every day. They also had small groups at other times. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy. Yeah, we used to have Fifth Sunday Fellowship. Remember that? This is Fifth Sunday, but we can't eat together. They had explosive growth because they didn't have a great quarterback, a great conductor, but because they played together as a team. I have to preach this message now because I know it's very easy for us to get used to the new normal. And it's pretty easy to stay at home and to watch the service in your pajamas. Maybe even not at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, but sleep in and watch it when you want. Or not watch it at all. And all of a sudden, not going to church on Sunday becomes a habit. I'm afraid lest some people develop new habits because of this break that we have in getting together. Third, finally, to make beautiful music together. Yes, we have to practice to make it beautiful, but we have to actually get together in order for us to make music. All of you together, verse 27 says, are the body. It's nice to have you here, and but we say, can I see a show of hands? It would be nice if you had more than hands, if you had complete bodies out there, right? It would be nice on Sunday if the whole body could show up again soon. Do you remember almost a year ago when they said, we need two weeks to stay at home to flatten the curve? <laughs> yeah, right, two weeks. How's that curve flattening going? If only the quarterback shows up for the game, is he foolish enough to even try to play? Or does he forfeit and save his life? If you only have the lead actor and you show up and you pay full price for admission, do you want your money back because there's no one else for the lead to act with? No stagehands to even open the curtains? If there's only the church here, on, and only the pastor here on Sunday, are we really a church? What if there is only violins playing? Well, it's pretty for a few notes. Oh, I know that song. But it gets pretty redundant just to hear the violins playing the melody. There is no symphony without the other instruments. The word symphony comes from two words in Latin. Sim, which means together, and phony, which doesn't mean phony. It comes from phone, which means voice. Telephone means a distant voice. I can hear you on the telephone if you're distant. Symphony means voices together. And guess what? By definition, an orchestra is not an orchestra, is not a symphony until they are together. We are God's symphony of praise. And yes, we can worship God all alone in the woods on vacation, but we are not a church until we are gathered. The beautiful word here, symphony, is the key to the passage back in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. For first of all, when you come together as a church, do you know what the word church means? Gathering. It means coming together. When you come together as a church, Corinthians eleven twenty. 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, God expects us to come together. Did you know that the Corinth church was a Baptist church? I bet you didn't know that, but we know they're a Baptist church because of this next verse, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. Therefore, my brethren, when you, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Yeah, we Baptists, we sure can eat, can't we? They eat together. Well, they were allowed to. We're not even allowed to do that, right? But we need to when we can. Maybe by the next fifth Sunday. Notice also in chapter 14, where we'll close out this study, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 14, 23, Therefore, if the whole church come together in one place. I want you to notice that this verse suggests that they met not only together, but they met in small groups. 
They met in homes throughout the week, and then they met in the, they didn't have a church building like we did. They borrowed some temple or something, and they got together at a great big meeting place. But the whole church got together for a corporate worship, but most of the time they got together in small groups. When you come together in one place, which we do once a week, or we try to, that's one thing, but you also need to get together in small groups. More on that in a moment. Now the violins can practice together and the cellos can practice together, but it's only a symphony when they get together all in one place. And notice a few verses later, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, whenever you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Everyone has a different gift. You can be a very talented athlete. You can be, let's say hypothetically, the most gifted quarterback, the greatest arm. You can throw the ball like a laser 100 yards, but you're not a quarterback unless you're on a team. And you're not an MVP unless you play for one of the 32 NFL teams. You are not a football player unless you play football. And you don't play football unless you have a team. And so it is very important for us to be on a team. We usually have a normal collection of excuses to miss worship and not come together. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. Or maybe we have an angry heart. But now we've got all the excuses today. We've got cold weather, we've got rain, and we've got coronavirus. And so it's easy for us to stay home. We have the dilemma of Noah. Noah didn't want to go in that ark. It smelled in there. You know what was in there? A bunch of animals. And when there's animals, there's manure. And Noah didn't want to go in there. He would have to spend a lot of time cleaning. But if it wasn't for the storm outside, he wouldn't have put up with the smell inside. Is it perfect in the church? No. Now, I'm not saying it's as bad as Noah's ark. It doesn't smell like Noah's ark in here. But some people say, oh, I don't want to go to church. It's full of hypocrites. Yeah, we got room for one more. Come on in. Yes, church is not perfect, but it's better in here than it is outside in the storm. You see, the church needs you, and even more than the church needs you, you need the church. And we need to get back together because if you take one branch out of the fire, the fire doesn't go out, the fire suffers, but the branch's fire goes out. And if you're separated from the fire, it is you who suffers most of all. If one cellist forgets their cello for not just the practice, but for the concert, the orchestra won't sound quite as full. But do you think there will be one person who will even notice that cello wasn't there? No. The conductor will know. That cellist's mother will know. But that cellist will miss out on making beautiful music together. But that's only two-thirds of the picture. The church needs you, and you need the church. But we don't play for ourselves. We don't even play for the team. We play for an audience of one. God waits breathlessly for us to make beautiful music together. We need to meet in three different levels. We need to meet together as a congregation, as a crowd. That's a, a big group of 100 people. That's people where we don't know each other's names, perhaps all of us, but we are a part of something big, and that gives us enthusiasm, and that gives us energy. We celebrate together once a week, but we also need to be known, not just look at the back of somebody else's head, but sit face to face in a small group in someone's home or in a Sunday school class where we not only socialize, but we also know one another. And then there is, other than that community, there is the cell where you have a few people who know you and hold you accountable and encourage you. We need all of those things. We need a great big gathering like this, and we need a smaller group maybe to get together in a youth group, and then in small groups because we need to know and be known. It is our goal to not only be a church with groups, we want to be a church of groups. We want to have everybody in the church, not just an anonymous name 
out in the pews looking at the back of someone else's head. We want you to know and be known and to sit with others who know you. We, we would like to see 100% participation in groups in this church because we need fellowship. We need to know and be known. Sometimes when a person misses church, they complain and say, nobody missed me. Nobody cared. Nobody called. Now that may be a reflection on an unfriendly church, but more than likely, can I be honest with you? If you miss church and nobody missed you and nobody cared and nobody called, maybe it's because nobody knows you. Proverbs says to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. You reap what you sow. And so you need to be a part of a body, not just the big celebration, but a part of a class, a part of a small group. It is not just a slogan on the front of our bulletin. The front of our bulletin says it every week, knowing God, changing lives, connecting with each other. Over the past two weeks, we've looked at those first two elements. It's why we gather as a church. We want to know God and we want other people to know God. We want to have our lives changed, and we want to see desperately other people's lives changed. They need the gospel. But we also need to connect with each other. God made us for each other. This is where discipleship takes place. Yes, we need to know God. Yes, we need to see lives changed. That's discipleship and evangelism. But fellowship is where real discipleship takes place. So here is the kicker, here is the key. What happens when we get together in small groups and in large gatherings and we make beautiful music together? What happens when the whole orchestra gets together, gets in the same key and plays the same song? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if the whole church come together in one place, and all do their part, prophesy, or an unbeliever, or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced not by the preacher, not by the band, he is judged by all. Every player on the team, just the one who makes a block, just the one who backs up the quarterback, every part in the play, every part in the orchestra. And verse 25 if that person comes in and every cylinder's firing, everyone's doing their part, thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. I want you to get this. I love this verse. Verse 25 is my prayer for Troy First Baptist Church. No visitors tripped in here today. No surprise, right? They've got every excuse in the world. But if they did, or maybe they stumble on our internet feed, what is their reaction? Wouldn't you like this to be the result of someone walking in here? The secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. I will never forget about 10 years ago, a young Philippine wife stumbled into our church in suburban Baltimore, and she sat in the back up on the riser seats, and I shook her hand before church introduced myself. Her face was already wet with tears. I said, are you all right? She introduced herself and said, yes. Yeah. She said, I just... We haven't even started yet. There wasn't one note of music, not the message. She didn't even know I was the pastor. She said, something's different here. I met her at the door after the service. She gave her heart to Jesus during the service. She saw something even before the band played, even before the preacher preached. And the next week she brought her husband, who also came to Jesus. And I had the privilege of baptizing both of them. You see, it wasn't a preacher. It was everybody making beautiful music together. There is no feeling like when the church gets together and works together. There's no feeling like when the conductor raises the baton, the instruments stop their fighting. And if you've ever been to a concert, they start tuning. But then 
When the conductor raises the baton, taps, he gets everyone's attention, and the melody begins. You know, when it starts, it's just the violins, and then maybe the violas join in. But then slowly, surely, even the cellos get to play. And then that bizarre harmonic hiccup doesn't sound ridiculous in the next room. It sounds like a part. It sounds like an amen. And the parts that we practiced at home now fit the bigger piece. And we understand that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And then the cellos reach a rest. They don't get to play and they have to put their bow down for a minute and listen to the horns play or the woodwinds play. Or maybe the cellos come in with long sustained notes that just fill out the chord. But now the beautiful melody and the harmonies are lifting all of us and our hearts are soaring. There's no resentment, there's no jealousy because it's just a beautiful thing to be a part of the symphony, even if you're in the audience. The sore muscles, the callous fingers, the hours of practice seem worth it as our hearts are lifted together in worship to God. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Oh, wouldn't you love for someone feel that way when they saw us worship God. And then as quickly as it started, it's over. And the hall is filled with the applause of one, our audience of one, not for the violins, but for all of us making beautiful music together. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for including us in your plan to bring the gospel to the world. We thank you that you've made the church the vehicle, the institution that you use to reach the world for Christ. It is exactly what we need. We need each other to know you, to see our lives changed and to connect with others. Lord, it's exactly what the world around us need. It's not a hard sell. Lord, they want to know you. They were made to know you. They want their lives changed. They want to connect with meaningful relationships. Lord, help us to be the church, the orchestra, the team that you designed us to be. Lord, if there's one here today who's never trusted in you as Savior, I pray that today they might become a part of your great family but I don't pray that they'd become a part of this team. Lord, if there's one watching here or around the world, Lord, I pray that they would make you king of their lives, but they would also join this church or another church close to them where they can be a part of what you're doing here on the earth. Lord, help us to connect with each other and be your church, your symphony, your team. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to sing together that hymn that we started with this morning, Be Thou My Vision. You've heard over the past three weeks, my vision for this God's church. Let's stand together and sing, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs> 